The Witch of Blackbird Pond Chapter 3 Along with her pretty shoes, Kit's spirits sank lower at each step. She had clutched at a hope that dark fringe of dripping trees might somehow be concealing the town she had anticipated. But as they plodded along the dirt road past wide, stumpy fields, her last hopes died. There was no fine town of Weathersfield. There was a mere settlement, far more lonely and dreary than Saybrook. A man in a leather coat and breeches led a cow along the road. He stopped to stare at them, and even the cow looked astonished. Captain Eaton took advantage of the meeting to ask directions. High Street, the man said, pointing his jagged stick. Matthew Wood's place is the third house beyond the common. High Street, indeed. No more than a cow path. Kit's shoes were wet through, and the soaked ripples of her gown slapped against her ankles. She would naturally have lifted his skirts free of the uncut grass, but a new self-consciousness restrained her. She was aware at every step of the young man who strode behind her with a trunk balanced easily on each shoulder. She relaxed slightly at the first glimpse of her uncle's house. At least it looked solid and respectable compared to the cabins they had passed. Two and a half stories it stood, gracefully proportioned, with leaded glass windows and clapboards weathered to a silvery gray. The captain lifted the iron knocker and let it fall with a thud that echoed in the pit of the girl's stomach. For a moment she could not breathe at all. Then the door opened and a thin, gray-haired woman stood on the threshold. She was quite plainly a servant, and Kit was impatient when the captain removed his hat and spoke with courtesy. Do I have the honor of addressing? The woman did not even hear him. Her look had flashed past to the girl who stood just behind, and her face had suddenly gone white. One hand reached to clutch the doorpost. Margaret! The word was no more than a whisper. For a moment, the two women stared at each other. Then, realization swept over Kit. No! Aunt Rachel! she cried. Don't look like that. It is Kit. I am Margaret's daughter. Kit? You mean... Can it possibly be Catherine Tyler? For a moment I thought, Oh, my dear child, how wonderful! All at once, such a warmth and happiness swept over her face that Kit, too, was startled. Yes, this strange woman was indeed Aunt Rachel. And, once, a long time ago, she must have been very beautiful. Captain Eaton cleared his throat. Well, he observed, I am relieved that this has turned out well after all. What will you have me do with the baggage, ma'am? Rachel Wood's eyes focused for the first time on the three trunk bearers. Goodness, she gasped, do all these belong to you, child? You can just set them there, I suppose, and I'll ask my husband about them. Can I offer you and your men some breakfast, sir? Thank you. We can't spare any more time. Good day, young lady. I'll tell my wife I saw you safely here. I'm sorry to have caused you trouble, Kit said sincerely, and I do thank you, all of you. Two of the three sailors had already started back along the road, but Nat still stood beside the trunks and looked down at her. As their eyes met, something flashed between them, a question that was suddenly weighed with regret. But the instant was gone before she could grasp it, and the mocking light had sprung again to his eyes. Remember, he said softly, only the guilty ones stay afloat. And then he was gone. The doorway of Matthew Wood's house led into a shallow hallway from which a narrow flight of stairs climbed steeply. Through a second door, Kit stepped into the welcome of the great kitchen. In a fireplace that filled half one side of the room, a bright fire crackled throwing glancing patterns of light on creamy plaster walls. There was a gleam of rubbed wood and burnished pewter. Matthew! Girls! cried her aunt. Something wonderful has happened. Here is Catherine Tyler, my sister's Margaret girl, 
come all the way from Barbados. Three people stared up at her from the plain board table. Then, from his place at the head, a man unfolded his tall, angular body and came toward her. You are welcome, Catherine, he said gravely, and took her hand in his bony fingers. She could not read the faintest sign of welcome in his thin, stern lips or in the dark eyes that glowed fiercely at her from under heavily grizzled eyebrows. Behind him, a girl sprang up from the table and came forward. This is your cousin Judith, her aunt said, and Kit gasped with pleasure. Judith's face fulfilled in every exquisite detail the picture she had treasured of her imagined aunt. The clear white skin, the blue eyes under a dark fringe of lashes, the black hair that curled against her shoulders, and the haughty lift of her perfect small chin. This girl could have been the toast of a regiment. And your other cousin, Mercy. The second girl had risen more slowly, and at first Kit was only aware of the most extraordinary eyes she had ever seen. Gray as rain at sea, wide and clear and filled with light. Then, as Mercy stepped forward, one shoulder dipped and jerked back grotesquely, and Kit realized that she leaned on crutches. How lovely! breathed Mercy, her voice as arresting as her eyes. To see you after all these years, Catherine. Will you call me Kit? The question sounded abrupt. Kit had been her grandfather's name for her, and something in Mercy's smile had reached straight across the gulf, so that suddenly she wanted to hear the name spoken again. Have you had breakfast? I guess not. I hadn't even thought of it. Then tis lucky we're eating late this morning, said her aunt. Take her cloak, Judith. Come close to the fire, my dear. Your skirt is soaking. As Kit threw back the woolen cloak, Judith's reaching hand fell back. My goodness, she exclaimed. You wore a dress like that to travel in? In her eagerness to make a good impression, Kit had selected this dress with care. But here in this plain room, it seemed over-elegant. The three other women were all wearing some nondescript sort of coarse gray stuff. Judith laid the cloak carefully on a bench and reached to touch Kit's glove. What beautiful embroidery, she said admiringly. Do you like them? I'll give you some just like them if you like. I have several pairs in my trunk. Judith's eyes narrowed. Rachel Wood was setting out a pewter mug and spoon and a crude wooden plate. Sit here, Catherine, where the fire will warm your back. Tell us how you happened to come so far. Did your grandfather come with you? My grandfather died four months ago, Kit explained. Why, you poor child, all alone there on that island. Who did come with you then? I came alone. Praise be, her aunt marveled. Well, you're here safe and sound. Have some cornbread, my dear. "'Twas baked fresh yesterday, and there is new butter. "'Surprisingly, the bread tasted delicious, "'though of a coarse texture, like nothing she had ever tasted before. "'Kit lifted the pewter mug thirstily and abruptly set it down. "'Is that water?' she asked politely. "'Of course, drawn fresh from the spring this morning. "'Water! For breakfast!' But the cornbread was good, and she managed a second piece in spite of her dry tongue. Rachel Wood could not seem to look away from the young face across the table, and every few moments her eyes brimmed over with tears. I declare, you look so like her, it takes my breath away. But all the same, there is a hint of your father there, too. I can see it if I look closely. You remember my father? Kit asked eagerly. I remember him well. A fine upstanding lad he was, and I never could blame Margaret, but it broke my heart to have her go so far. But Rachel had come even farther. What could she have seen in that fierce, silent man to draw her away from England? Could he have been handsome? Perhaps with that strong, regal nose and high forehead, but so terrifying. And we'll... Call it a day here, 
and work on finishing this chapter next time. Till then, thank you so much for listening. Love you guys. Bye-bye.